Well, in the last episode, we took a look at the Lord's sovereign work in the heart of Cornelius, a Gentile, and the Apostle Peter, obviously a Jew, and how he worked in each of their hearts to bring them together so that someone like Cornelius, who feared God, could come to know the Lord. And that there were barriers that needed to be broken down in Peter's heart and how Peter, after learning his lesson, obediently went uh, as the Spirit directed him with the men that were sent by Cornelius to bring him back so that he can deliver the message of salvation to Cornelius and his household. And so today what we're going to do, we're going as we continue on in our, our look in the book of Acts, we're going to see uh, or we're going to read uh, Peter's sermon uh, to Cornelius and his household. Um, and also we're going to see the confrontation that happens between him and some of the other Jews in Jerusalem. So we got some good stuff ahead. My name is Steve Gill and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. Yeah, so Peter uh, boldly went where no other Jew had gone before. Um, yeah, that's that's the way I that's the way I kind of like to uh, look at things. That's the way I kind of like to consider things. And um, you know, we don't have to go into a, a great big detail and review as far as the things that we looked at uh, last time. But I do want to hit up um, on some of the on some of the highlights, um, mainly mainly with, with the whole thing, and I'll repeat this again, is that I just find it interesting how God worked in his sovereignty to bring these two people together, um, and how uh, when, you know, God had already did, did what he needed to do with Cornelius and sending the angel to tell him to send men to go get Peter, and then and then he decides to work with Peter the next day. And in his wisdom and his sovereignty, uh, God worked everything out so that by the time the vision came to came to Peter about the about the food uh, that he was to kill and eat. And how, while he was contemplating all of that um, right there at the door where that were the men that Cornelius sent, um, obviously Gentiles. And so it was just a matter of immediate application to the vision and what God was trying to get across um, with that uh, with that whole thing so I think that that was uh, that was amazing so while even in the vision Peter had his hesitancy because it says that you because again if you remember he sees the vision of the sheet coming down um, and uh, you know it, it says and there's all sorts of animals on there and the Lord says to Peter uh, get up kill and eat and Peter says that I've never you know never I would never do that I've never eaten anything um, that is that is unclean and the Lord re- uh, came back with to him and said do not call um, unclean what God has made clean um, and so that happened three times so three times this this whole exchange went on you know just according to script each time one two three and um, you know you can sense the hesitancy there um, but then when the, uh, uh, when the application immediately comes by, there's, there's nowhere for Peter to go. And so the spirit says, I've sent these men go down and don't be afraid to receive them in. And you see that the, that the lesson is taken hold because Peter does what the spirit says and he brings them in as his guests. And as Peter explains later to, uh, to Cornelius, uh, he says that when the men came, I, I went with them without objection and that's true um and so everything is just clicked for for peter um and you know as soon as he came to um cornelius uh and his household he says you know i i you know you you yourselves know that it's unlawful for me to do this but but god has kind of shifted me in another direction that's just the paraphrased version of what of what peter said and so um so the barriers in his heart had been had been uh, had been broken down. By the way, while I have this on my mind, I just want to I just want to throw this out real quick because I know that last time I spoke a little bit about clean and unclean foods and and the regulations and stuff there and how that was supposed to be a picture of separation and holiness. Not it's not anything health or dietary related. Some people try and make a, a 21st century application to that, but that has nothing to do with that or what we talked about um, was that this was a was a holiness issue this was a symbol this was a symbol of the of the Israelites separation from the other nations uh, namely in them being uh, forbidden to eat certain foods that other nations did so if they were to uh, interact with them in banquets there would be a, they would be surrounded by a lot of food that they wouldn't be able to eat 
Um, and so uh, it was it was this whole thing to picture separation from the nations. And I want to I want to give you a, a reference because I didn't do that last time um, of how those two things commingle together. Um, you know, just so you have a little bit more of a textual understanding of how of how all that is fleshed out. It's in Leviticus chapter 20 verse 25 okay that's where I get that from like so again like I said I didn't um, I didn't give a reference last time but I wanted to give that reference now so so I mean just and just as we think about Peter um, and how God used the whole thing of clean and unclean food and it's interesting I think I pointed that this out last time um, that um, that it's, it's interesting that he uses this clean versus unclean food, number one, because it plays on Peter's hunger that he was experiencing at that moment. But number two, if, we're, if what we're saying is correct about the, like the dietary laws and things having to do with uh, having to be a symbol of, of separation from the nations or a way to separate uh, Israel from the, from the nations so that they wouldn't be near them. And we're, again, what we're talking about more is like, people because of their pagan religions and things like that this this wasn't anything that was just purely racial there's other things that go into this um but obviously as god's chosen people set apart people um he set forth regulations including things with food um that would that were set in place to kind of magnify their their separation from the other nations and it's interesting that god uses this with peter and the reversal of this to show that the nations are going to be included into the family of God through Jesus Christ. And Peter's going to see all of this unfold um, as it relates to his encounter with Cornelius and his household. Okay. And so what we're going to, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the actual uh, message that Peter delivers uh, to Cornelius and his household. Again, remember, it's not just Cornelius, so even though the angel appeared to Cornelius and uh, from all indications didn't appear to anybody else. Um, you know, he, he summons Peter like he'd been commanded to, but it, when he, but he also brings back, uh, well, not brings back, but I mean, um, for, as far as Cornelius, Cornelius uh, invites friends and relatives um, into his house so that when Peter comes, they're all ready to hear what uh, what Peter has to say. And I, and I want to make a slight correction here, and we'll see this as we go on, but um, last time I kind of, I kind of, uh, I had said that um, there may have had may not have been any sort of indication that that Cornelius knew specifically um, what Peter was going to touch on or what he was going to talk about. Um, but when you read further in the text, and we'll see this when we in our text today, um, from the retelling of of the story of what Peter was saying to of, of what uh, of what Cornelius said, um, we see that the angel did tell Cornelius. Um, to go get Peter to tell you the message by which you can be saved. So at least, so, uh, you know, that is the information that, that, uh, that Cornelius has. It wasn't, that wasn't spelled out in detail in the other accounts uh, in the previous chapter, but Peter does lay that out um, to the people that he's, that he's telling this to. Okay, so, um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Now that, we've, now, we, now that we've kind of had a little bit of a review, um, we're going to go ahead and dive into the text here. And again, like I said, there's a lot, there's a big portion of this in chapter 11 that, you know, we're not going, we're not going to need to, to delve deeply into simply because it's a repetition of, of things that we've already looked at last time. Okay. So, um, let me go ahead and I'm going to read uh let's see we, we left off in verse 34 that's where we're picking up um let me read um verses uh, let's start out by reading verses um 34 through 43 okay and uh, it says here in verse 34 so peter opened his mouth and said truly i understand that god shows no partiality but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John pro uh, proclaimed, how God an anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that that he did both in the country of the Jew, of the Jews and in Jerusalem. 
They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who have been, who had been chosen by God as witnesses who are who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to, and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets uh, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Well, we'll stop right there for now. We, there's more to uh, to explore in the in the verses after that. But let's just take that that section there. OK, and so here we see that um, starting in verse 34, how there's a recognition from the part of Peter. Again, he, he, he's, he's expressing this whole thing um, as he starts to speak. He says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, um, you know, and that's you know, that's something that's going to be, you know, if you read the initial chapters uh, in Romans, um, particularly the first three chapters of Romans, you see that Paul lays out this very thing as he lays his case out. How God is the God of Jews and Gentiles and how Jews and Gentiles both have the same sin problem. Um, so it's not really we're not dealing with something where there's a matter of of, of God of one per, one group being better than the other. Nor is it a matter. Uh, is this a matter of God showing favor towards one over the other where forgiveness of sins is offered to the Jews and to Jews only? That's not what we're talking about here. And so with all of the things that Peter has uh, has learned and the lesson that's been shown to him up to this point, you know, he's able to say, um, you know, with much certainty, because he says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. Um, that's kind of in line with what what Paul himself says in Romans chapter two, verse 11. I believe that's what the what the reference is there. It says for God shows no partiality. And the context in that ha is is the whole issue of Jew and Gentile and all that went on with that there. So uh, so Peter's come to understand this. And he just as he goes into this, he, he kind of he kind of builds on what he's talking about here. Verse 35, he says, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Now, let's let's think clearly about this and let's understand um, what this does not mean. What this does not mean is that the gen that in every nation, whether Jew or Gentile and, or any nation, that as long as you do the right things, that um, that salvation will be yours by your by your own works. Of course, we know, uh, at least we should know that that's not that's not the case. That's not what Scripture. Uh, that's not what Scripture teaches. That's not even what we what we saw last time. Remember, we went over a little bit of, of that um, last time because Cornelius, the you know, just has the, what we saw of him as a human being. He seemed to be a pretty good guy. Um, he did fear the one true God, but his faith was incomplete because he didn't know about Christ. He didn't know Christ in a personal way. Um, he probably did hear about Christ, um, and you'll and you'll see why I say that here in the next few minutes. But um, but Cornelius um, was not saved. He will get saved. We'll see him get saved here, um, him and his household. Uh, but he wasn't he wasn't saved simply because of you know the things that he was doing, um, fearing God, giving alms to the poor and, and everything like that. Um, what, uh, way, the way that we explained it last time was that what we're probably dealing with is Cornelius as a Gentile who's responding to the light that's been given to him and then God is giving him more light and bringing him to a full, to, to the full understanding of God through Jesus Christ. And so as, P, as excuse me, not Peter, as Cornelius is responding to that light, God, God gives him the full light um, in the person of Jesus Christ, which would be opposed to what we would see in, in people who, um, who were rejecting the light. They rejected the light and uh, they would reject the light. And so God takes away whatever light that they do have. That goes, that's in line with what Jesus had said um, before in Matthew 13, whoever has will be given more and he'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what little he has will be taken from him. And I believe that that's what, that's what Jesus is referring to um, when it comes to something like that. Um, so that's what we, that's what we have there. So, um, so I would say that in this passage, the doing, the doing what is right is except, uh, um, let's see where it says here, uh, that but in every nation, anyone who who fears him and does what is right, and I, th I would say that the doing what is right is going forth and responding to the light that's been given to you. 
I mean, nobody has a perfect knowledge of Christ at the outset, but God does reveal himself, gives testimonies to himself, whether directly or indirectly. And so the question is, what is what's going to happen with that? How are people going to respond to that light? You know, a lot of, oh, listen, a lot of people, and we see this in Romans 1, a lot of people reject that light. And they, so they suppress the truth of God by their unrighteousness. So then when you look at Romans chapter 1, three times you see the whole thing where it says God gave them over, God gave them over, God gave them over. That's the, that's the manifest expression of God's wrath in this present age right now. Okay, so that's, that's an example of light being taken away. Okay, um, God's gracious hand, his protective hand being taken off of society. Okay, um, but Cornelius, on an individual level, even people in his household, we see something that's different. Okay, you even see the see even see this initially with the twelve disciples, because with the whole thing of whoever has will be given more, and he'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have, uh, even what he has, will be taken from him. Um, that was in response to the disciples' questions, asking, "Why do you speak to the people in parables?" And pretty much that's his explanation. Parables, uh, while they, while in some cases they were meant to reveal, in other, in a lot of cases they were meant to confuse, confuse those people who were in stubborn rejection of him. Okay. Now, with the disciples in particular, we know that the light is the, that the Lord continues to give them more light. Why? Because you have the disciples at times coming to Jesus and saying, "Hey, can you explain this to us? Can you explain that to us?" Okay, so they're responding to the light that's been given to them, right? And so Jesus gives them more understanding um, of the things that that have been that have been laid forth in the parables, right? And so that's so that's what you have. So so we're so all that to say again is that we're not dealing with something with salvation by works. I think we know that, but it's important to to uh, you know just to to confront that issue because just a straight reading of that that that's maybe what it sounds like it's advocating there. Now, notice there in verse 35, it says, but in every nation. So every nation means every nation. This is open to every nation. Um, it's not just a matter of where we now learn that it's outside of the realm of the, of the Jewish community, the Jewish, uh, the Jewish people. But it's just for these Gentiles here, here, and there, here. All these other Gentile nations, it, they're not worthy of it. No, that's not, that's not what that's saying there. In every nation, and notice here, every nation, anyone who fears him. And remember, Cornelius feared him, right? He was God. He, he feared the Lord. He feared God. Um, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And notice that, that the that term anyone shows the individuality of this whole thing. And so it's not even connected to what nation you're, you're, uh, you identify with. So that's why the Jews in themselves couldn't identify themselves as a whole. Like, well, I'm part of the I'm part of the Jews. I'm of the Jewish nation. I'm of the Jewish people. Therefore, that uh, that I automatically qualify for acceptance in the kingdom. No, that's not the case. The the the, the, the case with the Jews is the same with the Gentiles. And here it says, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And that acceptability isn't isn't the isn't simply a matter of you know. Hey, a pat on the back and, you know, good job. The acceptability of that person is is manifest in God revealing more to them so that it leads them to salvation, because really that's ultimately what it comes down to. That's what people are being drawn to. OK, um, and so that's what that's what you have there. Now, as we continue in verse 36, it says, as for the word that he that he sent to Israel, that God sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ. And then in parentheses, this is interesting, he says, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. Now, let's just go back there. Um, you know, like it, we're not, we shouldn't be surprised if we're familiar with scripture. That verse 36 says, is where, where Peter's talking about the word that was preached to Israel. You know, Israel was the first to hear of this, you know, the preaching of Jesus Christ and everything like that. Now, all of his ministry pretty much with the exception of, of groups of, of Gentiles here. But, you know, for the most part, Jesus' ministry was aimed at the people of Israel. Okay, even when, even when Jesus sent out the, the disciples two by two to preach the kingdom, he says, go nowhere to the Gentiles or to the area of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of Israel, Matthew chapter 10, right? So, you know, Peter is taking them on, a, on just a, on a quick lesson, history lesson of just how this whole thing unfolded here. And so he says, as for the word that, that he sent, the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace. Now, 
I, I hesitate here to go further into this because actually we're going to talk about this whole thing of, of peace and preaching peace and the gospel of peace um, in a couple of weeks when we when we take time to um, to explore the uh, uh, another aspect of the gospel. But um, let me just let me just lay this out and then I'll I'll reserve everything else for um, for when we. Um, uh, for when we pick up this topic in a couple of weeks, let me just say this: that the peace that he's that Peter is referring to is not the is not the peace of God, but it's peace with God. Now, the peace of God is a reality for people who come to know the Lord and come to salvation. Um, but most of the time, when we're talking about peace here, I think I think here, and I think of other places like in Romans chapter five, um, the peace that that is that is being outlaid here. Um, is peace um, is peace with God, um, and so I'm just going to leave it there. I want to I want to just spend some time to talk about th- these things in a little bit more detail in a couple of weeks. Um, so uh, so it says that you know it says he was preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, and it is, and then the parenthesis says he is Lord of all. Um, you know, and that's and that's just an interesting parenthetical uh, just statement that Peter just kind of lays out there. Um, and that kind of gives you this idea that 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 Jesus Christ, whatever they may have heard about him, Peter wants them to understand that uh, that Jesus Christ is more than just a simple human being. He wasn't just a good teacher who did a lot of awesome things. Um, you know, as some people today like to say, you, know, you ask who's Jesus Christ? Yo, Jesus Christ was a good teacher, but he wasn't God. Well, no, that's not the case. You know, Jesus is Lord of all. Okay. Which really, which speaks to his deity, there, and so I think in that way, uh, Peter is under uh, is is really emphasizing the deity of Christ there, um, as well as the fact that he is since he is he is God and he is Lord of all. That means that he is Lord over Jews and Gentiles, and maybe in embedded in that whole thing as a reminder again, just to just to show that listen, he was preaching the the word was preached to Israel. But since he's Lord of all, this is something that spreads to the Gentiles too. So it, it speaks to the to the wideness of his of his realm, right? He is Lord of all, and also to the deity of of, of Jesus Christ. So we're not just dealing we're not just dealing with a, 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 a just a guy here. We're not just dealing with a man. A simple he was just a human being and nothing else who taught good things. And maybe perhaps uh, Peter lays this out, uh, you know, just to. Uh, you know, in connection to what he says and here with uh, where he says that he was uh, went about doing good. I mean, you know, he just wasn't just a simple human being. He was doing good. We, you keep in mind that this was somebody who is this is somebody who was Lord of all. OK, so as he lays that out in verse 36, he says in verse th- as to all of that, that we that that you that that's true in verse 36. He, he continues in verse 37 and he says, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee and after the uh, Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed? Now, I think that's interesting. That's highly interesting. Where where Peter says, "You yourselves know." So this isn't something where Cornelius and his household are completely ignorant about the person of Jesus Christ. They've probably they've probably heard a great deal about this Jesus fellow. You know, to what extent and to what degree they may have heard about him. Um, is unclear, but they have at least heard about him, um, perhaps, you know, after he ascended to heaven, but maybe even before, who knows? Um, you know, there's, there's no way to tell for sure to what extent, because the text doesn't go into detail of that. But all we need to know um, at this point right now is that this is something that that Cornelius and his household were familiar with. I mean, just as far as Jesus. So, um, they've heard about him and the things that he's, that he has done. So, you know, so as it says there, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea. Um, that's the Southern reason region beginning from Galilee. Okay. And that's the Northern area. And that's where that is, where Jesus started out his, his ministry. That's where he started out, uh, you know, just kind of started to preach, started preaching. It's in Galilee and places like Capernaum and, 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 and places like that. Um, so just a reading of the Gospels will, will reveal that whole thing to you. Now, eventually what you see him doing, um, aside from the fact that uh, those times when he goes to Judea into Jerusalem to celebrate the feast, and those are explained in a little bit more detail in the book of John, 
Um, but you see that and then also the time when his death comes near and he's heading resolutely towards Jerusalem. He goes into Judea and so he's doing his ministry there. So he says throughout all Judea, beginning from uh, be- beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. OK, now he goes into he goes into detail, a little bit of detail as far as, you know, just reminding them of the things that they've heard before, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Now, of course, this, as as Peter said, the things that happened after the baptism of the, of the baptism that John proclaimed. Now, when John baptized Jesus Christ himself, we read about that where Jesus is anointed with the Holy Spirit and, the, he, and the, the Spirit descends on him like a dove. And so, you know, even I, I think it's in the book of Luke and those some of those initial passages after that, you see where it says the Spirit led him here and the Spirit led him this direction. And so he's very, he's, he's being led and guided by the Holy Spirit. But the Spirit isn't just a matter of somebody who leads wasn't the wasn't what it wasn't just a matter of leading Jesus, but it was also giving him power. And remember the things the things that we see with Jesus and the miracles are all done in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not to deny the divinity of Christ Himself, but we have to understand that Jesus, while He was one hundred percent deity, was also one hundred percent humanity, and He submitted Himself to the limitations of humanity. Now, he did perform miracles that showed his divinity, but it was all through the power of the Holy Spirit as well, as the Holy Spirit led, um, which all came by the dictates of, of God the Father, because Jesus would say that he does only what the Father uh, allows him to do and what the Father directs him to do, right? And that's also that, also, that language also comes from the book of John. So here was a man with power, all right? And, and man, certain people of the Jewish community certainly did see his power. They saw people being raised from the dead, uh, people being healed of their infirmities and diseases. You know, that's why you had from time to time when Jesus was in a certain area, people just coming out in droves because they wanted to be healed by Jesus, right? They, they recognized that there was power coming from him. And they wanted a piece of that power, you know, because if they were sick, if they were if they were handicapped or disabled or, or whatever the case may be, if they were dying, right, they wanted they wanted the touch, the healing touch from Jesus. And so when there's a complete healing, that certainly does show the power that that is at work in and through Jesus. Right. So in the middle of verse 38, as we continue there, he says he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Now, this is interesting. Uh, well, let me just read that last part there. For God was with him. And so that's, you know, again, that's God being with him is, is along the same lines of what I just said a few minutes ago. But it's just interesting when we think about the healing and everything, how it says that uh, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. Okay, now what does that mean? Does that mean that every single ailment, every single sickness, every single inf- infirmity can be explained by the uh, by Satan being having direct contact with people who are, who have uh, who are suffering from such illnesses? No, I think you can look at that. Now, let me just say this: I think there can there is something to be said where the evil spiritual realm can have physical effects on people. Of course, that can't be done outside of the permission of God. Uh, but you, we do see examples of that in in the Bible. I think the the best known example of that is is Job. You know, God gave uh, gave uh, Satan permission to to lay his hands on Job, but he couldn't take his life. He says, "But you can't kill him." So um, the suffering that was afflicted on him bodily um, was of was of Satan. And so we see uh, his physical ailments that came directly from the evil spiritual realm. Um, another example, although probably a less, uh, not as much a, a, of, a, of an example that, that we're familiar with, um, is in Luke chapter 13, where Jesus heals a woman who had been bent over and couldn't straighten up. And so Jesus heals this woman. And um, she straightened and she's able to straighten up. And this happened on the Sabbath. And so you had people saying, hey, um, you're out of bounds for healing this woman on the Sabbath. Um, and so I just want to read you Luke chapter 13, verse um, uh, verses 15 and 16. Um, he says, then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to wa- to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, uh, 
be loosened from this bond on the Sabbath day. So there you get this idea that whatever this, this woman was suffering from, it was something that was she was bound by Satan um, and that he had, had a direct influence of that. So there is there are cases where Satan is directly or Satan and his minions. Satan isn't involved in every single sort of thing like that. I mean, he's not omnipresent, obviously. But in the evil spiritual realm, thinking in a general sense, um, we know we know that there can be just biblically that there are cases where that is the case. Now, is that the case with every single sickness and disease? No, absolutely not. But I think the way that we can understand this is that you know, you know, him being that, uh, um, well, how is it worded here again? Um, in uh, uh, and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. I think there's a way that you can look at this from a general point of view where the, the where the world, the fallenness of the world is all in, in the devil's do domain. So sicknesses, illnesses are, are a part of this current world system of which Satan is in charge of pretty much. Um, the whole world is in the hands of the evil one, 1 John 5.19. Um, and, uh, you know, how he's, how he's referred to as the God of this age, second Corinthians, uh, four, four, um, this is all a part of his area. And so uh, as, as time goes on, when, when Christ comes back and there's final victory over sickness and sin and everything like that, when Christ comes back, the devil and sicknesses and diseases and all that sort of thing will be done away with. And those who believed in him will be will be will exist in resurrected bodies in a new heaven and a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth that were that was cursed by by sin, and it was part of and it was part of Satan's domain, right? So that's so that's really what you what how you can uh, I think you can adequately explain that whole thing, um, but also at the same time, Jesus wasn't just in the in the in the business of of healing people physically. Um, he was all for the spiritual as well. Um, you know, just as just as um, um, Jesus uh, uh, said to the to the man in, in uh, John chapter. Um, I, I, at the moment, I'm, I think I'm getting this mixed up. I don't remember if this was the lame man in John chapter five or the blind man in John chapter nine. Uh, whichever case it was where, where after Jesus healed him, he comes back um, and Jesus says, see, you are well. You know, because, you know, he healed him. And then he says, stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. And I believe that what he was referring to there was calling him to repentance so that the worst thing, dying without Christ, um, wouldn't happen to him where he would spend eternity in, in eternal torment. Okay. So Jesus wasn't just about the physical. He was there to to heal and mend, mend hearts and lives, to bring people back into right relationship with God through him. And so really that's what you have also there with this with this uh with this releasing of 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 oppression from 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 Satan from from the evil one. You're leaving it clues of this much later in the book of Acts in chapter in um in chapter I want to say it's chapter 26 where Paul says that he was called to, to to call people uh to release people from the power of Satan to the power of God. Okay? So there's a transition from one realm to another, from one domain to another. And so people in, 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 in a, uh, the perspective of salvation are, are released from, the, from, bondage to, uh, from bondage to the devil. And that's all through Jesus Christ as well. Now, verse 39, it says, And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. So there's that whole thing again. Because remember, Peter and the other apostles were, were designated as witnesses. Now, we, again, we think of witnesses. We think of sharing our faith. Now, that's true. Uh, but in this, in this context and even in other places where this has been used, and I think that we've talked about this before way, way, way back um, in, in earlier studies of our book of Acts, when, he's, when they're saying that we are witnesses of this, they are actually saying we are people who have seen this with our own eyes. You know, just think about think about the Apostle John and when he wrote his 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 uh, first epistle, those first what four verses or so it talks about that uh, Jesus is the one that they've that they've seen, they've touched, they've listened to, you know, all those sorts of things. That's that's the language of a witness. That's the language of somebody who says, I was there when I saw this whole thing. So Peter's saying that we were witnesses of the of of um of this. Um we were witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. 
Okay, so all of these mighty works that he did, um, you know, and, and doing good and, and, and releasing people from bondage. Peter says we that we were there. We saw these sorts of things happen. But in the but the ending part of verse 39, it says they and they meaning the Jews, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Now, my goodness. I mean, when you read the succession of those verses, it just seems like, you, you know, what an awful thing. You know, you have Jesus doing good and releasing people from oppression, and then they put him to death? Why? Well, now, we don't need to go into that. We don't need to analyze that. If you're familiar with Scripture, if you've read the Gospels, you know why. And Peter doesn't feel the need to delve into that. He just he focuses on what's truly important there in talking about the actual death of Christ, how he was killed, and how he, uh, they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, um, obviously meaning the cross. Um, Cornelius being a Roman soldier would have known what that was all about obviously you know a crucifixion that was a favorite um, mode of execution for for the Romans at that time Um, now here's the thing that's just that's just one part of the sentence there but let me read the other part of there which it goes into goes into verse 40 so let me let me go back to that last sentence in verse 39 and then into verse 40 he says they put him to death by hanging him on a uh, on a tree but Gotta love that word, but God raised him on the third day and made and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who uh, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. So there's a there's another case where they were witnesses. They were witnesses of his resurrection, and that's nothing new. And that's nothing new for Peter to say, because Peter had said that before too in his Pentecost sermon and elsewhere. That he is a he was a witness to to uh, to this to the resurrection, so in an indirect way you kind of have the same the same concept of he was put to death but death couldn't couldn't uh, keep hold of him and he and he rose from the dead he 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 exited the grave if you will, as that but says it leads into in verse forty but God raised him on the third day, and made him to appear now. The emphasis here in verse 41 is, is pretty interesting. It's pretty important. It says, it says, not to all the people, you know, and, and just imagine what that would have been. You, in our human minds, in our, the way that we might strategize something like this by our own human wisdom, we might think, well, okay, the best thing for Jesus to do once he rises from the dead is to go and show himself to everybody, even to the people who put him to death and everything like that. And that would instantly change people's minds, you know. And so we would think that that would be the perfect strategy. I mean, you, if the people thought that they killed you and then here you come out walking and saying, hey, I, you killed me, but here I am, I'm alive, see, you know, that sort of thing. But that's not what Jesus does. Now, that might make people scratch their head a little bit. And they, they ask, well, why wouldn't Jesus do that? No, again, I think part of that goes into the whole thing of, uh, of responding to the light that's already been given. And the, well, just really what goes on with the hardness of heart, okay? We're dealing with, okay, even, if we're, even before the resurrection, we're dealing with a situation where Jesus was driving uh, demons out of people and, they, and people were saying that it's only by Beelzebub that, that he's able to drive out demons. And that's, you know, to say something like that, Jesus essentially was saying, is, it shows that there's nothing else that can be shown to you that would convince you um, of, my, of me being the son of God. And so therefore he says, therefore he's able to say to those people that, you know, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is a sin that will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. Okay. That's the true display of, of ultra hard heartedness, right? It was there. They were, there were stony hearts and there was, they were, they was not going to get fleshly at all. And so even when we, that's, we think about those things before the resurrection. Now, when the resurrection actually happened, if you notice, uh, particularly in, in, in Matthew chapter 28, um, when the soldiers tell the, the Pharisees what happened, um, they don't deny or they just say, oh, get out of here. That didn't happen. I mean, they see the empty tomb and they don't question and they say, well, maybe he wasn't really dead and in these sorts of things like so many other people, so many skeptics try and do today. Well, maybe he wasn't really dead. Jesus's uh, Jesus's uh, bitterest enemies didn't deny that Jesus was dead and that he'd been laid in the tomb. They they knew. Listen, they knew that Jesus was alive. But what did they say? 
They say, well, he really was the son of God. And then they repent. No, they, they, they give the soldiers a sum of money and tell them to, and, and order them to tell this cockamamie story um, about how the disciples came and stole away the body and, and all such nonsense. Hard heartedness. Yeah. So really with, with hardness of heart to that level, Jesus refuses to continue to reveal himself to those people. The light that they had, what little they had, will be taken away from them. And that's, and that's pretty much what, what you have going on there. As well as people, uh, other people of regular Jewish society, some of them anyway. Now, many of those people um, were, were, were pilgrims uh, from outside of the land of Israel who are there in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, they go out and then many of those people are going to come back and they're going to become saved as well as the local people in Judea and Jerusalem as well. And of course we see that at Pentecost, um, you know, but that's after the Ascension. So we're not, so none of this is to say that just because Jesus didn't appear to everybody after he rose from the dead, it doesn't mean that, that, you know, that's their last chance. That's uh, many people's last chance and that they wouldn't come become saved. No, that's not the case. And we know as much because we look we looked at looked at Pentecost in in very in great details uh, several months ago. So the fact that Pentecost happens shows us that Jesus didn't necessarily have to appear to everybody in his fully resurrected form to turn people around. Okay, but just as far as who he who he decides to to show himself to, he shows himself um, verse forty one. He said not to all pe- all the people but to us who have been chosen by God as witnesses. So there's this, there's this choice that, that, that goes on there. And this wasn't just, a, this wasn't a choice that were, that was made um, just at that time of people who, um, uh, you know, of people of, of these, uh, let me try and word this right there. This wasn't a choice that was made after the resurrection. God had already made his appointment before when he designated these people as apostles. There were many disciples, and then he chose 12, designating them apostles. I believe that's in Luke chapter 6, I believe. Um, and listen, he, he, he appeared to a lot of other people as well. In 1 Corinthians 15, you learn that he appeared to 500 people at the same time. He appeared to his brother James, right? Um, but in the immediate context, what, what, uh, what Peter is trying to get across here is that... Um, uh, you know that uh, that he appeared to to the apostles, um, had, whom he had chosen as as witnesses, and listen, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead, and that might not seem like a big statement, but it is pretty much saying that we know that this was some that he was in bodily form, and not just some sort of spirit or apparition, as people would would superstitiously may have may have thought and pushed back on. Jesus says, well, we ate and drank with him. Ghosts don't have bodies. Jesus had a body, and we knew that it was a physical body because he ate and he drank. He took food in, okay? So we're dealing with a real, a real Jesus with a real body who really was risen from the dead, okay? Verse 42, he says, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Okay, so that's interesting. We know we know that the, the Jesus gave them the Great Commission, which applied to them um, in, in context, uh, uh, applied to them in the immediate uh, context, but by extension applies to all of us. The commanding to, to preach. Now, notice, notice how he words this here. Um, that he, they were to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. Now, that's an interesting thing. That's, he says that that's what, we're, that's what we're to go and to preach about. And, of course, I, I think that's totally in line. I mean, we think, well, wait a minute. I thought they were supposed to preach good news of, you know, to, um, that, you know, that Jesus is the Christ and he is forgiveness of sins. Yes, and Jesus did actually tell them that, too that you were to be witnesses and that they were to call people to repentance for the forgiveness of their sins. But I think this is what you have here. You have people who, who, who uh, the apostles, as they, pre- as they preach the fact that God was judge, that, that God appointed Jesus to be judge, they give a warning of upcoming judgment and calling people to repent so that they can escape judgment and enter into a right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And I think that's, that's how that works. And it covers all on all areas. 
because it says he's to judge the living and the dead. So that means if Christ comes back when people are alive, he judges, he judges people who are alive and he judges the people who are dead, who are in the grave. They're going to be raised up as well and judgment is going to happen to them as well. You're going to have some people who are going to go into eternal life and some people who are going to, be go, who are going to go into eternal damnation. Okay, but it's interesting. He just he, he says the the testimony that we're giving is that he's that God has appointed Jesus to be judge, um, you know. And so for for a society in a time today when when we think judgment is not um, a po- uh, shouldn't be expounded on, that's actually what what the what the apostles were commanded to preach and to testify to. And so Jesus, and that's still the case today. Jesus, it, there's a day um, where. When Jesus comes back, he's going to judge the living and the dead. And those who don't know him, that when that judgment comes, it's not going to be a happy time for them. And I shudder to think that for a lot of those people, when that time is too late, they're going to enter into eternal judgment and no way out. I mean, if you really ever just stop and think about that for like two seconds, um, you know, I I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes it sends a, a, a shiver down your spine. Right. But that's what they that's what they testified to. They testified to the fact that Jesus that that um, um, that Jesus was a, was appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. OK. Verse 43 to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So you think that the gospel message was just something that's just New Testament? No. Peter says right here. Uh, To him, all the prophets bear witness. The prophets, who are the prophets? The prophets of the Old Testament. They themselves bear witness that everyone who believes in this, this here sounds like New Testament verbiage here. But I mean, in one way or another, the, the prophets pointed forward to this and talked about this. And everyone who believes in his name receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Okay. That's just like that's just like the whole thing to, of of the righteousness of, of of God that's imputed to us the justification that's not just that's not just something that's uh, that's revealed to us in the New Testament era it's not a mystery let's call it let's let's to use the biblical term it's not a mystery something that was kind of hidden in the Old Testament was now been revealed in the New Testament you know the whole thing about justification and the righteousness uh, the righteousness of Christ be uh, Christ being imputed to our account was something that the law and the prophets testify to according to and according to Romans chapter 3 and so the same thing here the whole thing about the gospel the prophets knew about it and they testified to it in fact peter this same peter um who uh, um well let me just read this here because i think it's interesting cuz this comes from what i have in mind uh, comes from Peter's epistle. We're listening to Peter talk about how the prophets um, wrote about this. And um, in first, let's see, is it, uh, I think it's second Peter. Let me see here. Um, let's see here. Well, let me uh, see. See, I didn't write this down. I wasn't planning on on uh, on turning to it here. Um, it's not coming to my mind right now. But it's you know where where it talks about um, um, where the prophets were were trying to find in what manner and what way you know, they're trying to find out about the things that have been revealed to them about the Christ and the glories to follow. And it says that it, it, they weren't they the, the whole thing of what was revealed to them wasn't for their benefit, but was it was for our benefit. And so that's what that's what he that's what it was uh, that's what he was talking about there, okay. And so that's what that's what that pointed to. So it's just interesting. Peter writes that in his epistle, and um, and so we see that even before he writes this epistle. Uh, talking about the prophets and how all of that is it, it had even been spoken of beforehand through the apostles. Now, as Peter is speaking, let's take this next set of verses here um, in um, in chapter in, ch- in chapter ten, verses forty four through forty eight. And so it says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word, and the and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water 
for, bapti for baptizing these people who had received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Okay, so as, now notice this, as they're listening, as Cornelius and his household are listening to this, they believe and they become saved. And the manifestation of that salvation comes in the fact that the Holy Spirit comes on them and they start speaking in tongues. Now, I know that we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating where that it does where speaking in tongues doesn't isn't a a present day thing where, you know, in order to to authenticate your faith or to show that you're that you're that you're really of the faith that you need to speak in tongues. Again, there was a purpose for that, just as there was a purpose for the Holy Spirit coming down um, when the apostles came and laid their hands on them to the Samaritans in, in Acts chapter 8, and even with what we see here, okay? We, and, and, I and I think really what you have is the same reason that this happens here where they speak in tongues and everything like that. Now notice, now notice that what you have here, there's a difference. We're talking about outside of the Jewish sphere, you know, the gospel has been preached to the Samaritans and to the Gentiles here in, in Acts chapter 10, right? And um, you remember when we looked at chapter 8, how the Samaritans believed, but they didn't receive the Holy Spirit right away. And so when Peter and John came down, they, they laid their hands on them and prayed for them. And then as a result of their prayer, the Holy Spirit came down. And remember when we talked about that, we talked, we said that that was so that, uh, that, so that there could be that unity there because if the Holy Spirit came immediately on them at that time, there would be this, this, this risk, so to speak of people thinking, okay, Samaritans receive the Holy Spirit, but they are not of the same people as the as the people who receive the Holy Spirit who are Jews. Okay. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit upon salvation because there needed to be a bridge that needed to connect this the the two the two groups of people together. So Peter, who held apostolic authority, who was a Jew, who came down and was uh, him along with John was as a witness to see all of these things. They see the Holy Spirit come down. I speculate that what you see there is that they spoke in tongues. The text doesn't say that they did, but my suspicion is that that's what, that was what they were doing. Whether that was it, whether that was it, or whether it wasn't it, there was something manifest in them that gave everybody the clue to understand that they now have the Holy Spirit. And we know that's the case because Simon saw something there, and then he gave money to the to Peter and says, "Give me this, give me this power, so that I can lay hands on people and that they can receive the Holy Spirit." But there you have there you have the the bridge that's the the apostles that serve as the bridge they themselves as Jews who lay their hands on these Samaritans and so that signifies that shows indisputably that there's unity in Christ between believing Jews and believing Samaritans right and there's no way to get around that so there is no church of the Samaritans that are separated from the church of the Jews and uh, they are two separate people that's not the case through Christ they are part of the one body okay now. Here we have something different. We're dealing with Gentiles here, with Cornelius and his household. We're dealing with a group of, of, of Gentiles. But here, as they believe, the Holy Spirit immediately falls on them. We don't even have Peter laying his hand on them and, and, and asking that they receive the Holy Spirit. The idea that you get is that they, as they're hearing this, everybody in their, in, their, in their heart is saying, this is something else. We believe in this Jesus fellow, and we, and we want to come before him. We want to submit to his lordship. And as that, as that goes on, they, they become saved at that point. Notice no, no prayer was necessary. No sinner's prayer was necessary. Okay, just want to slip that, that little nugget in. Um, and so they, they believe, and then they receive the Holy Spirit. And so they start to speak in tongues. Um, so it fell on all who heard the word. And um, so, th so, that's, so that, there's that big difference between, uh, between um, what we see with the Samaritans and with um, uh, with these with these Gentiles here. Now, why the difference, though? Well, I think the difference is because whereas before you didn't have an authoritative apostle there to witness this whole thing and to see this and to kind of give this stamp of approval, that which would have said a lot to a lot of people in the Jewish world. Um, while the apostles weren't there right away when when the Samaritan when the Samaritans believed here in Cornelius in his household, Peter is already there. So the, the coming of the Holy Spirit can happen right there at the moment of, of at the moment of conversion as he's preaching the gospel to Cornelius and his household. Now, 
I think that also does bring up a little bit of a question, though, because people might ask, OK, that may be true. But again, like as you yourself said on, on past broadcasts, um, you know, Cornelius is not the first Gentile to have um, uh, to have been uh, to have re- accepted the gospel. So what about the Ethiopian eunuch? Why didn't this? Why didn't we see this happen to him, where the Holy Spirit comes down and he starts to speak in tongues and um, and everything? Now listen, that didn't happen to the, that didn't happen to uh, the Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch, obviously, and it didn't need to. Um, and he, we understand that he was someone who genuinely became saved. But I think the idea was with him, there was just one person who was there, uh, you know, giving the message, and that was that was Philip. He was the only Jew in that situation with um with uh, uh with the, the you know Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and maybe some other people that he may have been traveling with here Peter has witnesses and I think that that's the important element here there are other witnesses to, who who can uh, who can attest and affirm to what's going on here and so that's why this comes out and this is why this God is going to use this to kind of break down barriers for in the hearts of the other the other Jews as well, particularly in Judea and in Jerusalem, because you see there um, it mentions um, in verse 45 and the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed. You remember that when Peter left Joppa, he he brought uh, other people with him, other believers with him, other brothers. And we know that these brothers are other Jews and it says so as much here. And so they were amazed as well. Now they might have been; a, they were pro- probably a little bit behind, the, more behind the eight ball than Peter was at that point, because they didn't have a vision, uh, you know, uh, revealed to them or anything like that. Um, they may not have known specifically what, um, you know, what led Peter to go with these men to uh, to Cornelius's house, um, or what their attitude was when Peter says, "Hey, come on, we're going to this this Gentile's house," um, or whatever. But they were it. But it says there that uh, th- those people who were circumcised, uh, the believers who were circumcised, who had come with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on Gentiles. So they're saying, OK, well, goodness, it's even on the Gentiles. Wow. So, th- I mean, as far as their thoughts go, they, they might have been a little bit behind where, P- where Peter was as far as understanding everything here. Now, no doubt, though. The fact that the that these Gentiles receive the Holy Spirit is going to is going to permanently solidify this understanding in Peter's mind of 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 God being no respecter of persons and how this whole thing touches not only Jews but Gentiles as well who come to know the Lord through G, uh, through Jesus Christ. Okay, so Peter's already there, and there's witnesses there, and so that's why I think you have this difference between what you see with Cornelius and what you see, what we saw in chapter eight with the, with the Samaritans where this, where the Holy Spirit didn't come right away. Now, and so that's there, it's a special occasion that we see all of this going out. So that's, so we're not, we're not to, again, we're not to take from this, that when somebody becomes saved, if they don't start speaking in tongues or something, then that shows that they're not saved. Or if they don't start speaking in tongues sometime, sometime down the line, that that means that they don't have the spirit. And so they have to continue to ask for the spirit and then the spirit will come sometime later. That's a misinterpretation and a misrepresentation of what's going on here for people who advocate those sorts of things. Okay. So there's a purpose behind all of those things, the way that we see them laid out in the book of Acts. Okay. So his, so Peter's Jewish uh, companions were, were amazed at this. And, and amazed at the fact that this was that this is something that happens to Gentiles too. So we're like, wow, it's truly amazing. So in verse forty, um, excuse me, verse forty six, he says, "For they were hearing them speaking in tongues." So there it is, as they were speaking in tongues and extolling God. They were extolling God. Okay, so what a sight! You know, it may have been the case that for these Jews, they the only people that they saw extolling God were other Jews. And they never would have thought what it would have looked like for other people outside of the Jewish community to be extolling God. And it kind of reminds me of, I mean, this was this isn't what I'm about to say, is it meaning to say that I didn't think that other people, other nations, other cultures could extol God. But really, when you're when you're surrounded by your own culture and stuff and you go to church in your own culture and in your own city and things like that, you're used to you're used to other Americans you know, seeing other Americans extolling God. Now, in two instances, when I've been overseas, uh, 
and been with people from other countries in their own country worshiping God. It's truly an amazing thing. And I, it's just amazing, not because I didn't think that it, that it was possible. That's the one difference between me and what we see here with these Jews here in this passage. But I, I wasn't I wasn't amazed because I didn't think that something like that was possible. But it just get, it just widens your perspective. So when you're sitting um, in the middle of a of a uh, of a schoolroom, it really wasn't a schoolroom. We met at a school, but it, the the surrounding places of it was was kind of a. It kind of resembled more of a garage, actually, if you want to know the truth. But whatever the case, um, meeting in a school um, with Indians in India um, on a Sunday morning and wa- and watching these people worship God and not knowing, uh, you know, if this was an, a, 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 an Indian song, uh, worship song, not understanding what they're saying or what they're singing, but they're singing and praising God in their own language. Um, and being around Christian brothers and sisters who live halfway around the world that I have the chance to visit and to interact with. Um, it's just amazing watching people of other nations worshiping God in their own language. Um, and so it's just, it's just, for me, it's amazing in that sense. Um, I don't know if anybody else has that, has had that kind of experience before, but it just reminds you of the fact that God is not a God just of Americans, um, or is not a God of just a God of, of, whatever city or whatever state that you're living in. God is a God of the whole world. And he's up to a, a lot, a lot of things that are much bigger than what you and I can conceive of. You know, I mean, just think about it. It's true. When we think about what's going on in the world and how God is active in the world and how he brings people in other parts of the world to himself. I'm not even talking about foreigners who live here in the United States, as wonderful as that is. We're talking about in other places in the world, how God intervenes in places and other in, in people to with people in other places in the world, just as he does in the United States. And that's truly amazing. That's wonderful. So it's just a joy and a, and a privilege to be able to be a part of this whole thing where you where you're in the midst of your own brothers and sisters who are of a different nationality, a different culture, who believe in Jesus Christ and they're singing and praising God and extolling God in their own language with songs that I don't know. I don't, now, I've heard people in other language using, uh, still singing in their languages, but singing a song that you're familiar with that you can tell by the tune. So you know what they're saying because you know what the words are in English. But I mean, in other times where they're, where they're singing something that you're not familiar with because it's not something that's from America. And they're and they're worshiping God and they're lifting up their hands and they're and they're worshiping God and they're worshiping Christ and God is up there saying, I love it. I love it all. Right. And so that's and so in some way I can identify with these Jews, but in another it, it but not perfectly. I mean the situation isn't perfect. These Jews here are totally surprised because they wouldn't have thought that it would be possible that the Gentiles would even be able to partake of this, just as the Jews did. So it's important that there was that witness aspect there of these other Jews along with Peter to see all of this happen. Okay, so it says, um, as it says there in verse 46, where they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, and it goes into verse 47. Now watch this. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And so there's the whole there's the whole thing, the connection that that uh, that Peter is making, that this is the same thing that happened to us. And we're seeing the same thing happen to these people. Now, remember what 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 Peter had said in in, uh, in Pentecost when he was calling people to faith and calling people to repent, repent every one of you for the and be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, that, well, that was that was Peter's words at Pentecost. Now, Peter's looking at this. He's seeing that pe- that evidently these people have received the Holy Spirit. And so he says, you know, he what's the, what's the next thing that we need to do? Well, let's baptize these people. He says, is there any it, 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 the way that he words this is if he's saying, is there any objection? Is there any objection at all to us moving on to the next step right now of having these people baptized? And so here again is another example of the immediacy of baptism. The soon after somebody, these people come to faith, they immediately, they immediately think baptism, not 20 or 30 years down the road. I know I've talked about that um, in, in past episodes before. I'll just mention it again, just, just so you get it in your heads. That's the, that's the pattern that we keep seeing here in the Bible. When people come to faith and, and immediately or soon after, 
um, the, the, the next step of obedience is baptism. And so he, he said, the question is interesting. Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And it's, it's like that ending part is, is, is put in there to give the implied answer of no. So in other words, it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, is there any objection, anything objectionable to bringing these people to the waters of baptism? Is there anything that can keep them back? Is there something, you know, and Peter's not asking this because he doesn't know. He knows what the answer is. And it's, and this is another reason why it's important that those other Jewish guys were, were there as well. This, the six uh, um, Jewish brothers, the Jewish Christians there. Because if you notice, if you read on in that text, there's, you know, the, there is nobody who comes up and objects. There's nobody who says, well, no, 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 no. Uh, because these are Gentiles, we need to treat them differently or we need to really consider what's going on here. That would actually be a foolish thing, given the fact that they've seen the Holy Spirit come down and these people are speaking in tongues right in front of them. <laughs> right. And so is, is with, with Peter saying, is, is essentially saying, is there any. Uh, is there any objection to this? The fact that nobody uh, among those six that came with Peter objects shows that this is the real that this is the real deal, and that they are convinced. They themselves are convinced as well. So Peter has some allies when he comes back to Jerusalem, and he has these people who are confronting him about going into the house of a Gentile, right? So he says. And so he says. Um, let's see. Find my place there. In verse 48, it says, And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Okay, so they were baptized, and then he remained with them, remained with the Gentiles. So now, we again, we've seen that, that, uh, that Peter has, has fully um, uh, immersed himself into the whole thing of being around Gentiles. And that would be his way. You can read in Galatians chapter 2, Peter was used to hanging out with Gentiles. Now, of course, he had a little bit of a foible because he was afraid of what the Jews would say when some people from the circumcision party would come in and they were, he was afraid of what they would say. So he started to withdraw himself from the, uh, from the, um, uh, uh, from the Gentiles. And Paul had to oppose him to his face and say, what are you doing, dude? Right? So, but he remains with them um, for some days. How many days? We're not entirely sure. OK, but he stays with them and, you know, he probably taught them and told them more about Jesus and, and taught them more about the faith, probably doing the same things that Jesus had instructed them to do. Baptize, you know, uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I've commanded them. So I wouldn't be surprised if what you see, uh, what, what was going on during that time was what you see happening in, in Acts chapter two, verse 42 where people were devoted to the apostles' teachings, where people were, were uh, devoted to Peter's teaching here in chapter 10. I wouldn't be surprised that that, was, that that would be what was happening. I mean, they didn't ask him to stay and, and to remain, just to hang out. I mean, they were hungry for more truth and hungry for, for, for more scripture and for the word and things like that. And so no doubt that's, what, that's the activity of Peter during that time. Okay, so that's chapter 10, but that's not the end of the story here. So we get into, we get into chapter 11 here. And uh, in chapter 11, um, in these in these initial verses, notice what it says here. It says, now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Okay, so word had spread. And and so and here's here's the thing that what they heard, what, notice closely what they heard. They, they heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. Okay, that the word had been preached to them. And I guess they would have understand, perhaps even would have understood that, that there was some acceptance of some sort on their part. But I think the idea is that they heard that, they, that the word had been preached to them and that they had received the word from the mouth of Peter. Okay, that's, that's, that's the rumor going around. And so in verse 2 it says, So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Now, you notice the objection here? Um, notice the objection isn't as specific as, as the description of verse 1. Um, it's not along the same lines here. It's not along the lines of, hey, you, you, why did you go and, and preach the word to Gentiles? Preaching wasn't even the part of their objection. Now, by default, it is just based on what we, what we hear these people complaining about. But um, it, it comes to show you that the fact that <clears throat> 
it's not even on their minds that the, that these people received the word as wonderful as that is. And just with everything that happened, just how, how wonderful things are. Their whole thing is, is still on the whole thing. It's unlawful for Jews and Gentiles to get together and to hang out and for Jews to go and spend time inside the house of a Gentile. That's where their mind is. And so what's their objection? Their objection is you went, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. See, that's the thing. And what we have to understand about eating is that when you're, when you're at somebody's house and you're eating with them, in that culture, what that signified was, was close, intimate fellowship and friendship with one another. It's not just two people or a group of people hanging out. No, there's, there's, they're, they're identifying themselves now as close friends. And so the Jews in Jerusalem have heard about this. They've heard about what Peter has done. And they say, that is not okay. You went and had fellowship with these people. Never mind that they received the word. That doesn't even come up into the picture. The, 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 first, the first and foremost crime in their eyes that Peter committed was that he went to, went to, um, went to, uh, to uncircumcised men. And you, you ate with them? You're identifying yourself as a friend of these people? What in the world is the matter with you? That's the idea there. That's the idea behind that, obje- uh, by, behind that objection. Now, when you get into verse 4 and following, I'm just going to read this large chunk here, and this is where I said a lot of this is just a repeat of what we've looked at before, but I do want to read it again. And these are going to be the words of, of Peter here as he explains himself. Okay, So in verse 4, it says, but the uncircumcised, oh, excuse me, oops, I'm reading the same line, uh, verse four, but Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying and in, the, and in a trance, I saw a vision, something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven uh, by its four corners. And it came down to me and it came down to me looking at it closely. I observed animals and beasts of prey and, and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard the voice saying to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times and, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that, mo- at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, so, uh, uh, in which we were at which we were sent to me from Caesarea and the spirit told me to go with him, go with them, making no distinction. So it, let me just pause there and say, it's just interesting because, you know, he, he's even saying to these guys, look, the spirit told me to do this and told me to go without making any distinction. So if you have a problem with this, if you have any sort of objection or any problem, understand that you're objecting to what the spirit directly told me to do. You think that's going to shut some people up? Yeah, I think so. Um, middle of verse 12 there of chapter 11. Uh, These six brothers also accompanied me and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had, how he had seen an angel stand in his house and say, send to Joppa and bring Simon who is called Peter. He will, he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered and this is interesting here, verse 16. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, that you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then this is verse 17, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I? that I could stand in God's way. When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they, glorif- and they glorified God, saying, Then the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. Okay? So, I want to call your attention, if you go back to, to verse 16 there. This is, you know, and this is where Peter, we get a, a look into Peter's mind here as all of this was going on with the Holy Spirit. Um, is In verse 16 it says, And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Okay, so those are the words that um, 
uh, that remember way back in, in Acts chapter 1 that Jesus had told the disciples, the apostles, before he ascended. Okay, so they, the, the, Jesus had told them about that promise before going up into heaven. And, he, and they understood this to be talking, that Jesus was talking directly to them. Okay, I don't think there's anything within that passage in chapter 1 that would give the disciples the idea that this was something that would happen to the Gentiles as well. Or maybe that maybe there was supposed they were supposed to understand that, but they just didn't. But with this, hearing Jesus speaking directly to them, they understood this to be to something that's spoken directly to them and would be applicable only to them and maybe to uh, to um, to other Jews at large as people came to know the Lord. But here's the thing: and so the, the disciples are aware of what happened at Pentecost. They were participants of that. They, the tongues of fire came down on him. They on them. They started to speak in tongues. Um, at Pentecost and everything like that. So that's a fulfillment, right, in Peter's mind and in all the apostles' minds of what Jesus had said to them. He says that, that John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost comes, boom, fulfillment of that, right? So, and, and, so, and, and then, you know, obviously we know that the Spirit is a permanent residence within them, and he works in them with power. Now um, we get to, uh, as as. Peter is preaching in the household of Cornelius, he sees the same thing happening to them that happened to Peter and the rest of his uh, rest of his friends on the day of Pentecost. Okay. So Peter says, I remembered the word that Jesus spoke to spoke to us about this. And, you know, he's just pretty much thinking that it that it was directed towards them. But then when I saw this happen to Cornelius, you know, he said he he says uh, he, he says, verse 17, if then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, and we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says when we believed in the Lord Jesus, I think he's talking in large part not just to the apostles, but to other Jews as well, you know, um, because there were people who believed, because the, the, the apostles were already believers but they didn't have the Holy Spirit, but they did receive the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. From that moment, from that moment on, people, people of the Jewish persuasion who came to know the Lord received the Holy Spirit upon conversion. Um, so that's so he's talking to not just the apostles, but to other believers as well. So it says, if if then God gave the same gift to them as He gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I like this language here. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? Just think about that. Who who was I? You ever thought? You ever think that sometimes we object to some to certain things, and we realize, and we don't even realize that things are biblical. The, the the some of the things that we object to are are actually things that are biblical. I've heard people object to things, and I don't know why this pastor did this or this or this. How could they do something like that? And they object, and I think, well, that sounds biblical to me. That sounds like he's obeying this passage, this passage, and this passage. Um, you know, but, you know, it, it, it really comes to the whole thing of, look, God is God is the one who's calling the shots. God is the one who's running the show. If that's the case and I see this going on here, I can't say, wait a minute, objection. You can't do this to these people because these are Gentiles. Remember when Jesus was was speaking, was propping up the Gentiles when he spoke in his uh, in his hometown in Nazareth in the synagogue. There was the opposite effect there. People were mad at him, and they were getting ready to throw him off a cliff. Peter has a whole different outlook on that. And when he sees with his own eyes what's happening with Cornelius and his household, he says, who am I? Who am I? I and not only that, not who only who am I, but who am I that I could stand in God's way? Let God do what he wants to do. You see, that's, and that's something, that's something that we can, that we need to consider closely is that so sometimes in, in, in certain situations and certain circumstances and certain ministry contexts and things like that, sometimes it, I think there's something to be said about just letting God be God. Sometimes on an unconscious level, we can say, well, God can't do this, this, and this because that's not my experience or I've never known it to be that way. And, you know, God can't work this way, this way, and this way. Now, of course, we have to test everything that happens in light of Scripture. But that's another problem, though. We, a lot of people aren't familiar with Scripture. And so God does this, this, and this, and then we say, he can't do that. Well, actually, yeah, he can. Just look at Scripture. Just look at what it says here, here, and here. And so we, we, we insert ourselves as, as authorities in certain areas, not really knowing that, hey, 
God through Jesus, God, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, you know, as the head of the church has every right to do this, this, and that. And if he decides to do this, this, and that, who am I, who are we, who are any of us to stand in his way and say, God, you can't do that. I mean, you might ask the question, do people actually do that? Well, they might not say God, they might not come out and say, God can't do this or God, you can't do this. But really by our actions and by our objections to certain things, that's really what we're saying. Again, if what's going on is biblical, okay. And so we have to be very cautious of that and be be aware of that. And again, that just shows the importance of measuring everything in, in light of scripture and what scripture actually says. Okay, so he says, who was I to stand in, in God's way? So then in verse 18, the last verse here, um, it says, when they, when they heard these things, they fell silent. They, they, really, they, they, they couldn't say anything. They, they, there was nothing that they could do to object. Peter already said, the Spirit came to me. They showed me these things, and the Spirit said, go with them without making distinction. So are you, gonna, are you going to object to anything after that? No, and rightly so. So he said, when they heard these things, they fell silent. They couldn't say anything else. And they glorified God. And that's, that's, a, that's another next step in, in the right direction, right? They glorified God, saying, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. It's kind of, it's kind of a, a weird statement because they say this. And then, you know, from a reader's perspective, looking at this, we look at this and we think this is something that you should have known before this happened, actually. And that may have been the case, and there might have been an element of surprise in, in, in the statement, but there's also a, 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 an, an element of praise. Because remember, and remember, again, it says that they glorified God. And so at that moment, as Peter is talking to them and sharing his testimony, there's a, there's a, there's a change of heart within these, people, within these people's souls about how to look at all of this. And so by the, by the time Peter gets done, they glorify God, and they uplift God and saying, this is awesome. Before, they were objecting that Peter even went there to begin with. Now, they're saying, wow, praise God. He says that the Gentiles, all, to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance unto life. Notice they, they, they hold the whole thing of repentance and the, the repentance is granted to them. See, man, man in and of themselves are so dependent when it comes to salvation that they can't even come to them without God granting repentance to them. I know that I think I've mentioned that before. And even in hearing it now, you might think, oh, I don't know if I can, if I can, if I can embrace something like that. Well, I can't help it, though. That's what Scripture says. Not only there, but in, uh, uh, but in 2 Timothy, um, in, uh, in chapter 2 of 2 Timothy, um, and uh, let me find a good place because this is a long sentence here. In verse 24 and following, he says, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may, God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. Notice that. Grant them repentance. That's the first part. Second part, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Do you see that? And that's how that works with everybody. Salvation is a sovereign work of the Lord. I mean, if you look at Ephesians 2, the sense that you get is that even faith, our faith is a gift from God. That's how dead we are. That's how debauched we are. There's nothing inwardly of, uh, of us that can, that can muster up any, anything to even have a proper faith. And even when it comes to repentance, see, the Jews here understood this. They understood. It says, then, the, then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance. That leads to life. He's granted them repentance. So it, notice, and it's just very interesting how the words are, are, are stated here. It doesn't say that, that God has granted them life, although he did. That's true. But he says he's granted them repentance that leads to life. All right. Now, this whole thing with repentance, we've talked about repentance before several times, actually. We don't need to go through it again, but it's that 180, right? And so I, I, the interesting thing that we, that we can notice here, to the Jews' credit, is that they have repentance in mind here. So when they're, when they're saying, wow, the God has granted even the Gentiles repentance, 
you know, you might you might think of along the lines that you know Gentiles definitely need to re- repent because of all their paganism, all this, all that, and everything. But the fact that they bring out repentance and say that the Gentiles also were granted repentance implicitly implies that they understood that in from for Jews they have to understand their sinfulness and repent. So it's not like it's not like we're you know we're dealing 100% with people who think that they're better than them because they're more moral necessarily. They understood they understand that the way they came to know the Lord was by repenting of their sins, which would obviously uh, uh, imply that they understood that they were sinful and in need of a savior, right? So that's kind of to their credit and just what you see in this in this phrase here. Um, but they get it now. And so you see how God orchestrated everything for starting with first starting with Cornelius and then bringing Peter into the picture. And then he would use Peter and these other witnesses, because, again, the witnesses, the six believers that Peter that went with Peter was it was so important that they went with him. So they come because they didn't object. Remember, Peter essentially asked, is there any objection to baptizing these people? And there was no objection. So they had been, they baptized them. And so, you know, it was it's just amazing how God brings all of these things together. Okay. Now, next time, what we're going to do, we're going to finish up chapter 11 and we're going to see this whole thing with this relationship between Jews and Gentiles um, in a broader sense, not necessarily having to do with any specific apostle. And these are people who are, who in many cases were at work with, with one another Um you know, just uh, you know, just as they went out preaching the gospel, this this goes back to um, focusing on the what was happening with the believers who were scattered outside of, out of Jerusalem when when uh, Stephen was stoned. So we're going back a couple of chapters to chapter eight when we saw that they were scattered, and so the rest of this uh, rest of this chapter, starting in verse nineteen and following, shows us what's what's been going on with that, and then specifically what goes on with a particular community of people and what we see is that they're reaching out not only to Jews but also the Gentiles as well and just see how Jews and and Gentiles serve one another so more and more you know we see we see barriers broken down in Peter's heart uh, uh, br- barriers broken down in the uh, the the Jews heart in Jerusalem and then we see really I think these people that we read about in the rest of the chapter chapter 11 were ahead of the game and so we see how the how whatever barriers may have been in place are fully broken down and how you have Jews and Gentiles serving one another. Okay. And so we're, we're going to talk about that next time, but for now we're going to leave it there. Um, and like I said, we'll finish up uh, chapter 11 next time. If you like this show, um, and you haven't subscribed already, I encourage you to subscribe to my show on iTunes. Also, uh, you can, you can look me up on Twitter, Loving the Scriptures on Twitter. My actual handle is at LT Scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for Loving the Scriptures. All right. Um, like I said, we'll leave it there. Um, looking forward to going into this next uh, part of the journey. We're moving right along um, in uh, in the Book of Acts, and we got a lot more exciting things to explore and to look at. Obviously, um, and I hope you're excited about uh, looking at all of it and just beholding the wonder and the power of God through the Holy Spirit and all of this. All right, so my name is Steve Gill, and I will see you here next time. Bye now.